introduce ourselves really quick. Um, I'm Jeremy. I am uh, kind of your co-host here today. Uh, I am part of the Equilibrium Ventures team in Austin, Texas. We are an alt Focus Investment Manager. I come from the world of Silicon Valley building startups, but more importantly, because you're here to learn about finance, this is all about Itai. Itai is our resident finance guru. He uh, started an options-based hedge fund that suffered from major, that, that exploited major dislocations. Did I get that right, Itai? You got that right. You didn't suffered, suffer from suffered. If, if I suffered from major dislocations, I probably wouldn't be here today. And yeah, we're suffering from Jeremy's description. <laughs> uh, that's, that's true. Well, so, so Itai's a built wealth management practice, ran a successful hedge fund. He's a pretty smart guy. Um, and today we're really lucky. Our guest speaker, Aaron Wallace, who's here, um, he was uh, part of uh, Universa, which is one of the probably the biggest tail focused hedge funds out there. So if you've heard of Nassim, Ta is it Nassim Talib or is it Talib? Am I, am I saying it right? Talib or Talib. Talib. Okay. Right. Yeah. This would be the author of the Black Swan. This is his hedge fund. So you, you guys are you guys are in for a little treat today. So the way I see it today, um, Itai, is that uh, I know you got a whole bunch of content. You're about to let everybody know about what's happening in the markets. And then you're going to teach them all about the options. So we're going to be, it's a Greek day. It's a European day. You ready for it? Greece, uh, Greece has not seceded from the EU just yet. Okay. Maybe, maybe by the end of this, <laughs> they will have, who knows? <laughs> so Itai, um, do you want to take this over and uh, walk everybody through your presentation? Yeah. Uh, thank Jeremy for having me uh, here as usual as the speaker. Uh, also, thank you for uh, thank you, Aaron, for coming in. We'll come into you uh, shortly. So uh, this is a little bit more on the, um, this may be a little more on the technical side, but I just wanted to share uh, some of this content. So let me just get started on it. Can everybody uh, see the screen? Ooh, yeah, we can see it. Thumbs up, everybody, if you see it. Shapiro, yeah, I'm looking at you. Aaron, thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's, uh, I really need to activate that, uh, that subscription back. Dude, it's $7. If you really want my login, <laughs> I will share, I will share it there. I think you're doing well in life enough where you can give Microsoft <laughs> just a little more money because they're suffering. All right. There, I hear there. that they are really struggling to make money nowadays. Right. You know, I'm going to buy the subscription and you can go along Microsoft tomorrow when that happens. <laughs> Okay, so Equilibrium Ventures, um, again, unique asset class. We focus on alternative assets, um, create low, low volatility uh, growth strategy as a result, and I'll just drop, hop right into it. So uh, the first thing I wanted to note is uh, following the Fed dot plot, it really seems that rates are going to stay low for quite some time. Here's all the dots representing FOMC member uh, opinions of interest rates going into the future. And we can see there's a single person thinking rates should be higher in 2022, and maybe uh, a few dots in 2023, longer run, they think long-term rates will be somewhere two and a half percent. So even if you think about the long-term, you know, rates maybe five, six, seven years from now, they're only thinking about two and a half percent. And there's almost complete consensus that rates are gonna stay zero until 2023. So for all planning purposes. Itai, FOMC, what, what does this mean? Why should somebody care? It's the Federal Open Market Committee. Um, they're basically the board that sits and discusses the, um, you know, the fate of the world <laughs> a few times a year. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so everybody's saying there's, there's zero interest, zero percent interest rates more or less until at least three, at least, yeah, at least 2023 and right. possibly, possibly a lot longer. Um, so another thing that happened in Jackson Hall, um, Wyoming, I think that was very important. And a lot of people um, didn't, didn't talk about that. I didn't see it covered too much. Um, but the Fed used to have these mandates where um, you have the uh, inflation target, which is 2%, as well as the full employment and of course, the third mandate, we talked about it, which refers to a rising stock market, right? Um, it's not an official mandate, but it could have been uh, official at this point. So 
now the Fed will tolerate inflation and they will actually not act if they see inflation going up to 2%. Um, Jay Powell actually said that they will come up with a flexible form of average inflation targeting. Now they're calling it FAIT. And basically they're saying that because we have periods where inflation undershoots that 2%, even if it goes above 2% for quite some time, it kind of makes up for the fact that inflation was low and it could potentially stay uh, above that level for, for quite some time. There was no definition of what some time means and this has been left completely ambiguous. So, so traditionally, if inflation hits, we use a raise of interest rates to kind of curb it. And they're saying, no, 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 no. We have, what, a whole bunch of debt on the balance sheet. We are double da doubling down on this strategy of low interest rates, even if that means the complete attrition of this middle class? Uh, yeah. I mean, so basically they're saying that even if, inf if we get real inflation, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see interest rates rise, unlike what we've seen in the past. So I think that's kind of a big deal. Um, so this basically means we can see more of this. Um, so right now we're looking at, you know, U.S. Treasury holdings. I don't think a lot of people realize the Fed has literally doubled their U.S. Treasury holdings uh, in 2020. Uh, it went from, you know, just a little over $2 trillion to $4.4 trillion. I think that's just, just insanity. Um, so, of course, that, that translates to um, the government being fully funded by the Fed and being able to spend whatever they want. And for all intents and purposes, we're living in a, an, a modern monetary theory kind of world where they can just do whatever they want and taxes don't really matter. And, and Itai, hypothetically, let's say if, if China were to dump all their treasuries, uh, how much like how much do they have? How like how how would that be even be impacted or quantified versus this type of craft? I think the Fed will be happy. They'll have more treasuries to buy <laughs> and print more money, right? So uh, I, I, China China only holds like I think two and a half trillion dollars in treasuries, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not even, you know, the Fed just did that in, in COVID, after COVID. It's not a big deal. Crazy. Okay, onwards. Um, there is still no official, official inflation. Um, you can see here 50s, 60s, 70s, where the CPI was. And really, um, inflation since the late 90s have been pretty tame uh, based on the way they measure CPI. Clearly, there, there are other ways to measure it show higher our inflation. Um, COVID clearly made inflation go a little bit lower. We can see this dip right there and we're nowhere near the Fed target. So they potentially have a, an excuse to continue for quite some time. Now, cool. I wanted to look over something that I thought was the main driver for CPI and inflation. I know some people say, well, you know, these quantitative easing policies and all the stuff that we're seeing is going to cause inflation. And people have been saying it since 08, 09. But we have to understand there are two headwinds that are really, really strong that are deflationary that clearly, I don't know, I don't know what, what, what's going to happen and inflation could eventually happen and we're losing control of the currency. But I feel like um, in a normal environment, we, we will not see inflation for, for the way the, the demographic pyramid looks like. So here, this is an example of how the USA looked like uh, for population pyramid in 1960. Uh, 1950, I'm sorry. So you can see here at the bottom, this is actually the boomers, ages zero to four. This is when they're born, um, right around this time. So they're actually already a big segment of the population. And then a lot of young people supporting less older people as they mature and, and get older. Um, and this is what causes a lot of economic growth. And eventually, you know, this little curve here is what caused so much inflation in the 80s. But Today, we actually have an interesting scenario. So here is the US in 2020. Um, I compared it to the age pyramid in Japan in 2000. And it is interesting to see that here's the boomers right there. You actually have less people in the middle and the millennials or you know, the, the, the children of the boomers are right here. They're just about the same age group and a lot less people at the bottom section um, and eventually these boomers are going to go up to these areas right there and they will be supported by a lot less people as this pyramid goes lower. So, you know, just think about it, less demand for houses, cars, et cetera. It's essentially, it's, it's deflationary. Um, Japan has had a similar thing already going in 2000. 
where they, they had older people right there and a lot of them, and this is the echo generation for those people right there. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because they have kids, so they're going to have more kids and um, very few children. So today, Japan looks like this, uh, where you have a lot of old people. You have some people in, in, in the workforce that support them and um, essentially no children is this literally looks like this. So this is um, a very unhealthy for long term economic growth. And it's it's quite deflationary. So I think all these central bank policies at the end of the day are correlated to this, where COVID just made it just made it accelerate faster. Uh, one quick question, Edie. Doesn't the Fed see really inflation on the economies expanding and doing well? That's when you, they usually raise interest rates because they think there's inflation coming and then vice versa as, a sto as opposed to like the Austrian School of Economics where it's like how much currency is being printed. So what's the, so what's the question? The question is, is, they, is the inflation based upon e economic growth? I know they're handling it differently now, but they, they always, to me, it always seemed like that they viewed it as, uh, as the economy is taking off, people, wages go up, people start spending more and it causes inflation. Isn't that the kind of traditional view of the Fed of how inflation is created? That's the traditional view of the Fed, and this is the you know that's why they're looking at CPI and break evens and all those kind of things. But you know, I'm trying to make the argument that it's kind of it's demographics that really move these trends onwards, uh, or at least they're 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 somewhat a part of it versus just pure amount of money in circulation and the total amount of transactions, because demographics have a lot of impact over the amount of transactions that happen in the economy. And there's another big headwind right now, which is technology, right? Because um, if you think about it, technology is super deflationary. How many jobs have Amazon created for how many jobs has Amazon taken away? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I always think about, especially with the computer too, you have, those, uh, you have those like pictures where you have a desktop that once had a phone and had a memo pad and had a whole bunch of other things and a, and a typewriter. And then it's like, hey, you have one computer, it does it all. You know, that's kind of like that in a nutshell, right? right. Well, and, and also traditionally, a lot of people don't know what ATM stands for. And, that, you know, it's automatic teller machine. And that was a big deal back in the late 70s, early 80s. Those were coming out because people say, look how many people you're going to put out of work at the bank. Because and this you don't is, have to go to the bank to get cash. That's true. And this is before we even start talking about self-driving cars and things like that. Maybe we'll do a uh, automation special at some point. I think that'll be interesting. I will say that I have been in David Shapiro's Tesla and we definitely use the autopilot feature going 80 miles an hour on the highway. I will tell you, I felt so much safer in that car than me driving. It stayed perfectly inside in the, in the middle of the road. My dad just got a Tesla as well. I mean, this is like, this is the future right now. If any of you haven't ever had that experience, the autopilot mode, mode is absolutely mind blowing. If you want to ride, I'll give anybody a ride who's in Austin. It's especially mind blowing when you run into a bridge. Very mind blowing. <laughs> well, we were lucky that we were in the middle of Central Texas. There were no bridges. Okay, so we're good. Uh, Itai, you can continue. Okay, we're just gonna hop into the main thing because we do have a lot. So I know our audience today is a little bit sophisticated. So we're gonna make this very brief for those that um, are not. Main idea: options are a derivative instrument of an underlying. Unlike futures, um, you know, at expiration, you are not required to buy or sell those. As long as American settlement can even be exercised before expiration. Uh, call options enable you to just buy something at a set price and put options enable you to sell it. Okay. All right. The easiest example for a call option, the house example. Every time you go under contract for a house and put option money, you're essentially going into a call transaction. Uh, Jeremy, you own a house. The house is worth 100000 um, I tell you, hey, I want to buy your house, not today, but in 30 days, I'm going to pay you $1,000 for that option period. You say done. You essentially become a premium seller. I'm a premium buyer. Um, now, three things can happen. The first thing is the price of the house goes up. Now it's worth $110,000. So essentially, I make $9,000 with a $1,000 investment, hence the leverage in, in uh, options because it enables me to control an asset worth a lot more with much less money down. Second thing is the price of the house goes lower, goes to 90,000, then I just walk away and I only risk my 
thousand dollars in this in this case, and of course, could stay flat. Nothing happens. It doesn't matter. Um, that's essentially the the call option feature. Cool. Put option. Um, so put option is very similar to purchasing car insurance. Any any person here that has a car and buys insurance essentially is uh, is a, a purchaser of a put option. Um, you know, let's say you have a car and every month you pay two hundred dollars for an insurance company, and essentially you're putting that insurance on your car, hence the put option. So if the car totals out and gets destroyed, um, let's say if it was worth $100,000, now it's worth zero, that insurance company will pay you that 100,000 in exchange for all those $200 a month that you're getting, um, that you paid. So for them, they get $200 a month and low likelihood of a crash. So they're getting consistent payment. And if they do it over enough people, they're going to, to profit. Um, for you, you get that, that protection. And clearly we're talking about the Colleen market where both houses and cars trade around a hundred thousand dollars. Amen. <laughs> All right. This is the very uh, simplistic view of basic option strategies for that end. So if you buy a call, your loss is the price you pay in a premium over the strike price. So you need, let's say you, uh, in this event, um, we purchased a call option on your house for $1,000 and um, we need the price of the house to be over $101,000 to make money. That's called the break-even point right there. Um, if you buy a put option, essentially it's the same thing, but in the other side, this is the price you're paying and you need the price to be below that break-even point, which is your strike price plus that option premium that you're paying. Um, when you're selling them, it's a little bit more intricate than that because you're getting that premium. So your profit is the premium. Anything at the premium or below is a profit, but if it goes above, then you can get, you can get hurt. So the idea would be in this case, as an, a premium seller for the house, you got a thousand dollars, but if the house is now worth $110,000, you only gained a thousand, but you lost 9,000. So you're almost 10 X your, your potential profit. Um, the put option is the same. Um, whatever it is that's below the break-even point, uh, strike price plus the premium, that's that's potential loss. So cool. far, so so good. Any okay. uh, any questions so far, y'all? Very easy for anybody that knows a little bit about options so far. Well, there there will be some questions coming up after this, I'm sure. Okay. Let's go and start going into the, uh, to, the, to the Greeks then. So Delta basically represents the change in the option price um, compared to the change in the underlying. So you can think about it as the Delta would trade between zero and one for a call option and between zero and negative one for, for a put option. So you can think about it this way that an option with a Delta of 0.5 will have in theory a 50 cents change for every dollar increase in the uh in the underlying um, another way to use it the traders like to use is uh probability so if we're looking at a 10 delta the black shoals model will tell us and we know the black shoals model is not perfect but theoretically a delta of 10 would mean a 10 percent probability of actually ending at the money at expiration so delta is very very easy and pretty straightforward to understand um, theta, this is something interesting. Theta, it basically represents the time value. So you can expect that an option that has 120 days to expire will be worth more than an option that has 30 days to expire uh, because it just covers more time. What's interesting, and I think a lot of newer traders don't fully understand, is that right around the 45 to 30 days, theta starts accelerating very, very quickly. And basically every day that goes by, you're burning more time premium. Um, this, by the way, this single Greek right there is the reason option sellers make money most of the time, because what they're doing, they're basically, they're basically selling time. That's what they do. So as long as no crazy event happens while they're selling time, this is what they're banking on. Um, so just something to know if you want to sell an option, the best time to sell an option is around 40 to 45 days to expiration where the theta really starts to burn. If you're an option buyer buying 120 days in, and then rolling it after 60 to after, you know, two months, 
and not letting it go through the accelerated part of the curve will save you a lot of money when you're doing your hedging versus waiting for expiration and when it's worth nothing. Got it. So buy further out, sell within 40 to 45 days. Okay. Yeah, that, I would say that would be a, that would be a good strategy. So gamma, gamma is a little bit complex, but the easiest way to think about it is the delta of the delta. So if the rate of change of, if delta is, if delta is the rate of change of uh, the, the option versus the underlying, gamma basically measures how quickly delta is going to change. And this is, an, this is a way, basically, the easiest way to think about it is how stable is the delta, right? So if you have a high gamma, that basically means the delta could change quite a bit for relatively small movements in the underlying price. Um, so you would think of options for Coca-Cola, they're probably going to trade more stable than options for, I don't know, Roku. Just a very, very simplistic example. And, and that's just because Roku has usually more of like a more, a little more volatility to it. Yeah, there would be more historically changes in, in those deltas. Well, and going back to your, your, your example on theta, you know, when, it's, when an option only has even like an hour to go and it's near at the money, the gamma goes crazy because, you know, the, the option, the volatility can be in the money, out of the money in the next hour. And so those options, you know, as the option gets closer to expiry and closer to the money, the gamma starts going more crazy. Right. And then there's a little known thing. Market makers have to hedge that gamma because they're not only looking at delta, they're looking at gamma. So one of the main things that people need to understand is SoftBank bought $4 billion worth of call options, um, you know, recently that caused that market melt up we talked about in the last call. But it's the gamma squeeze that caused these market makers to hedge with like insane amounts because the gammas on those options just went crazy. So that means that even a delta of 10 had a really high gamma, which means that a, a high probability to get in the money. So the flows that they needed to hedge were significantly higher, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, lastly, well, we talked last week about the two different types of volatility. We talked about the realized volatility and the implied volatility. So again, realized volatility is what actually happened, how the market actually moved. And the implied volatility is how the market expects to move expects future movements to look like right so Are you talking like the vix on a specific stock right so you can think of implied volatility as a vix on everything so everything in a way has its own vix if it has options trading it's probably going to have implied volatility so um you know you can talk about stocks and futures and even currencies and commodities they all have this this feature to them and that leads us to vega so Vega is the only Greek that can't truly be mathematically mapped accurately. So you can think of delta, you can think, you can think of theta, you can think of gamma. All these things can have a formula that's very exact to the, to the moment um, on, on the model. But it's very difficult for implied volatility to be priced correctly for the reason that implied volatility is driven by people's sentiment a lot of the time. And that is something that can't be mathematical. Um, we can try, but you know, in theory, a Vega, Vega basically tells you that there's going to be what kind of change in the price given an increase or decrease um, in volatility. From my experience, this is actually the least accurate part of the Black and Scholes model, even though it is accurate to a degree, but this is where opportunities uh, can occur um, and there's some kind of a trading edge that can be exploited. Um, some people think that theta is a trading edge, edge. I don't think it's a trading edge. I literally think that just like an insurance company, you're trading, you're trading, um, you know, the premium of time in exchange for taking on that risk. So that's not a true edge, even though it seems that way because you're making money 90% of the time, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so I wanted to go over um, an edge that I had in my hedge fund that I'm going to reveal today, um, how we made money consistently by using an exploitable event that continues to happen and can be exploited all the time um, with remarkable profitability. So basically the idea was to use options around earnings report in order to benefit from that Vega inefficiency. So what I mean by that is what we see before earnings, we have a very high implied volatility, high Vega. We have an inverted term structure, meaning that options for the near term sometimes trade a lot higher 
as far as their premium goes from the, those that are further away, and there's a lot of interest in there. There's also a binary event that happens, which is the release of an earnings report, or maybe an election that's coming up, or maybe um, you know, a Brexit vote, or a lot of different things that I've seen this, this happen. So this is a little snapshot from the Bloomberg terminal. I actually took this. Um, this is a real trade that was taken uh, in October 2014, just to give an example. Um, Google, at that time was Goog, wasn't even Alphabet yet, had an earnings announcement um, the following day on the 17th. So the 16th of October 2014, this is how the term structure looks. So you can see the 10 delta puts to the left and then the, the 10 delta calls here to the right. Um, and you can see the different prices and you can see the different volatilities. Literally for the next day, um, you know, volatility of 70 on the put side and 55 on, on the call side. This is, by the way, a time where the VIX is not very high, just an average normal market time. So this is how it actually looks like as far as the term structure goes. Here is the term structure for that near term options. Um, and you can literally see how it gets normal with time. So it's kind of like a heavy inversion uh, VIX curve. So why does this happen? It happens when traders and investors bid up protection ahead of an event. I call these events a known unknown. So imagine you're, you're, you're a Google investor and you are, you've been in Google, you've been in Google forever. You've been in Google since, you know, for five years. You absolutely are not considering selling Google. You could be a hedge fund, you could be a pension, you could be a, you know, pr pr private person. And you're like, you know what, I, I just have to hedge this because I don't know, the stock can fall 15%, maybe it's a bad report. So enough people do this that it creates the earnings um, just become, the, the options just become very, very expensive and Vega become very, very expensive. So the opportunity, the, the research that we've done actually shows that 87% of the time when these things happen, um, the options markets actually overstate the real move that's going to happen. And that creates a real trading opportunity. Um, the expected move of what's likely to happen, if you just add the put and the call that's at the money, you get an idea of, um, of how wide the move is going to be. So let, let's say Google trades for 500, the call is $10, the put is $10, the market's expecting a $20 move. If you sold both the call and the put, as long as the move is $20 or less, you would actually make money on this. Uh, but there's clearly a tail risk that if it's a $50 move, a $100 move, you can you can lose exponentially. So just doing a naked straddle is a little bit too risky. So what we were doing, uh, we had a lot of different strategies for different events, um, either doing some types of iron condors, which we, uh, we sell out of the money options and buy further out of the money options or what we call chicken condor, which we just sell a straddle to call them the put and then buy protection just outside of it. Sometimes we use different maturities, but I won't go too deep into that. So this is the real live example that we chose. Um, at that time, we sold the 525 calls and puts. That's essentially a at the money straddle. We bought the 550 um, calls and the, we bought the 500 puts, both close to 5% out of the money for that following expiration. Um, that looks something like this. So um, hey, I'm the scrap. Can you just make sure you point out exactly which things people should be looking at, which here is a straddle just for the people who aren't familiar. Right, so, so that, that's the P&L graph for the following day. Because the green again, line. Yeah, the green line for again, the, the, the option actually expired the following day. It was a Thursday night, I believe. And Friday night was, Friday was literally a following day. So it had one day to go. So in this one day, the, um, the stock would have to go plus or minus greater than 5% in order for you to lose money. If it actually doesn't move, you'll max up your gain right there and your losses are still limited and capped just because you're, you're, you're long these other options. So anything within this triangle would be, um, would be positive. So we have an expectation that 90% of the time we should be within this triangle. So very yeah. well, the next day, yeah, I'm sorry. So, so the next day Google did move uh, below the expected move. It opened flat and actually settled at minus 2.54%. And you can see what happened to the implied volatility the next day. It went from 58 to 28 and then kind of normalized. And you can actually see the pattern of known unknowns in just Google's implied volatility where we go out literally every earnings report. Some earnings report are higher than others. 
I think some there's more anxiety than others or the general market environment, general VIX environment. Um, but essentially every quarter you get something, something like that. So this is what the trade I like to call the, the known unknown uh, volatility collapse trade. If anybody out there uses uh, Thinkorswim, one of the things you can do is go to the analysis page. And if you look at my background, that's actually like Roku and it shows what happened before and after some of the earnings. And I, I guarantee you, you look at any stock and they will always look like this. The days before, the implied volatility is high. Then after earnings, which is the line here, these are two of them, it drops every time. I mean, it's like, I've never seen it not do this, no matter what stock that I've looked at. And it's, a, it's kind of an easy chart you can see in uh, Thinkorswim. They have it, I'm sure some other packages have it. And, and this, this is actually why so many people, when I talk to, um, they're like, I bought a call, Apple went up on earnings, how did I still lose money? I don't get it. So this is, this is essentially why. Cool. Um, I know Any that questions? Was, that was Before a lot we... right there, yeah. Any questions? You got Etai's attention. I guess, I, I, I guess, I guess you left him speechless. They were so impressed that they went right to their Bloomberg terminals and they placed all those trades and they're going to be wildly rich tomorrow. Uh, if you remember last week when we were talking, you know, Alex Green is not on the call tonight. This is actually one of his favorite trades and he would do credit spreads. And this is the trade when we're talking about the luckiest trade or the biggest trade you ever had. And that's the one where he pulled out a, chick a chicken condor. You know, he, he got what he wanted on the inside. It collapsed and he just kept the outsides because they were so cheap. And then a stock got bought out the, with before expiration. And he made like $100 on a five cent option. He got, he got lucky. I used, I, used to leave, I used to leave those uh, outliers out all the time. This, this is straight out, I think, one of the most profitable trades I've ever encountered with a consistent edge. You literally make money nine out of 10 times on these things. It's pretty unbelievable. And also the nice thing is there's lots of opportunities. There's just tons of opportunities. So you just have to watch earnings season and then there's just tons of opportunities and you can diversify. That's the other nice thing about it. And I would make a, I would make a small prediction right now, uh, given everybody here, I think we will probably see a similar event for the election. For, but instead of a, a company, it's going to be for the entire market. So under, understanding that, um, based on each candidate, if they win, how do you think the market responds? I don't think it matters. It, it, it never matters who wins. What matters is that everybody was hedged and the market just doesn't like uncertainty. Uncertainty is over, Un hedges are removed, volatility collapses. That's what people don't understand. It doesn't matter the outcome. Just like Brexit, everybody hedged, it was the outcome they didn't want, but volatility still collapsed. Well, I think the guys you had on on the VIX that showed the, uh, the futures VIX contract is up for the October, November election, but the, but the contracts before and after are below it. Same thing, people just, just want to hedge for uncertainty, but it will collapse afterwards no matter who wins, even if it's Larry Ingram. <laughs> ET, the only thing you have to be careful about is, you know, you protect yourself with those wings by, you know, getting along the wings. You can't make your adjustments for something like the election. Look at what ha did happen on this last election. Look at election night. Had somebody been de hedging their delta, they would have gotten murdered. But if they left it alone because they had the insurance to protection on the wings, then they would have done just fine. You know, we really didn't move in the end. Um, but the inner night swings, if you're hedging that gamma, forget it. You would have gotten murdered. I always, uh, I always wing it out. I never sell naked options. Right. But even, even with the, even with having it winged out and even if you're net long options, say you're, you know, say you're um, not just doing the butterfly, but you're selling the straddle and buying two strangles. Um, you know, yes, you have, you, you know, you'll actually make money on the massive move. But having said that, again, if you're hedging Delta, you know, as a market maker, I hedge Delta all the time. I had to all night long be hedging Delta and you would have gotten murdered, you know, because all you're hedging at that point, if you're talking about short term options in terms of the Greeks is the, um, is the straddle. The straddle is not moving. The other ones aren't kicking in until much later. But you've just got to be careful. But most of the move happened like in the overnight session 
and then by by morning time if i remember right. i remember going going to bed it was down like five percent and it was limit down or something and then when i woke up it was down like just one percent exactly and that's my point though but it, but a true hedger at five percent down would have had to be selling futures I, I right. know the scenario because that night I was talking to my broker at 2 and 3 a.m. because the S&P dropped 100 points and we were actually hedging like, with the underlying futures, the options, and getting whipped like crazy. That's what Everybody I'm saying. Everybody through yeah. it, woke up, yeah. and they were just fine because the event had happened. So, so it's, one of those, it, it's one of those cases where you literally have to know what is your maximum loss and be okay with it. So, I mean, for me, I have a general rule of thumb that I just don't do the overnight session because it's not liquid and a lot of the things that should kick in and price correctly don't, aren't, don't, or don't happen. So um, if I'm uncomfortable with the overnight until the next day session, I just don't do it. Okay. Um, yeah. But I don't, I don't trade the, uh, the overnight session because especially VIX futures and all that, they're just too illiquid. Sure. Yeah. Just all right, cool. I, thank, awesome. you for, thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Well, everybody, let's give a virtual round of applause to Itai for, uh, for doing a great job on that. Um, so Itai, thank you so much. Um, what I want to do okay. is just quickly introduce everybody to our guest speaker. Okay, so you guys are all in, uh, in a lot of luck. Our guest speaker is Mr. Aaron Wallace. He is the CIO of Carbide Capital. Um, prior to that, he was the head tra trader for seven years at Universa. And we were talking about how they were a multi-billion dollar hedge fund uh, specializing in tail hedging. And you've heard of Nassim Talib. This is his hedge fund. Uh, Aaron really knows his stuff, Stone Cold. He's really smart. You should definitely ask him questions. And uh, would love to turn it over to you, Aaron, if that's something you feel ready for. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I'll share my screen here. I have a uh, presentation I made. Uh, let's see. Can everybody see that or? We see uh -huh. your face still. <laughs> it's a beautiful face. Don't get okay. me wrong. Oh, hold, hold on. Here we go. Hey, there you go. That, that should work. Okay. Um, so ju yeah, just to expand on my background a little bit. Um, I, I, I initially worked on Wall Street out of school. I went to work at a bank, a KBC Bank. It's a European investment bank. Uh, we mainly specialized in a lot of derivatives trading there. We had an options desk and a convertible, convertible bond desk. Um, I was on the options sales and trading side. So um, I learned the business uh, there, you know, pretty much out of school. And um, our, our desk covered a lot of institutional clients, large hedge funds. And uh, we were basically buying and selling options and uh, coming, coming up with trade ideas for these clients. And uh, one of the clients was... Uh, Empirica Capital, which was founded by Nassim Taleb and Mark Spitznagel. Um, Empirica was basically a tail hedging firm, which was the pre precursor to a uh, Universa actually. So they were looking to exploit black swan events um, and they were a client of, of mine and that's kind of how I got connected with them. And they asked me to come work for them. So I moved out to uh, California to Santa Monica I uh, joined Universa in uh, 2007, and I was there for about seven years as their head trader. Um, and then Mark decided to relocate the business to Florida uh, for tax reasons. And, and uh, at the time, I just wasn't re really ready to leave California, and I wanted to go out on my own. So I set up uh, Carbide Capital, which is a CTA. Um, so I'm trading options primarily on S&P futures. Um, I have two programs. I have a uh, short options program, which mainly is writing options on futures to uh, collect premium. And then I have a uh, tail hedging program, which is mainly what I wanted to discuss here. Um, so the tail program is primarily long, far out of the money puts on the S&P. Uh, I occasionally trade NASDAQ or Russell, but they're not quite as liquid. So I usually focus on the S&P. Um, occasionally I'll do some bond trades as well, maybe buy call options on the 10 year or the 30 year bond. Although in this environment with rates at zero, it doesn't really make too much sense. Um, but when rates were higher, that, that was a pretty good tail hedge as well. Um, just betting that rates, interest rates would go down. Until they go negative. Yeah, well, that, well, that's true. They could always go negative. So, you know, those options are, could be cheap right now. I, I haven't actually looked at them in a while, but um, they, they could be quite cheap. Um, 
So, so yeah, so, so primarily it's, you know, hedges on the S and P I may sell uh, some call spreads to help fund that uh, premium. And generally what we tell people is it can be used as a outright asymmetric short strategy as opposed to just shorting the market because you know you're only spending a small amount of premium on options and then you have a lot of convexity if the market crashes you can potentially have a large payout but you're you know your your maximum loss to the upside uh you're not going to blow up in a bull market like if you just go out there and short the market for example um but generally what i recommend for the tail hedging strategy is that people combine it with a long equity portfolio, because, you know, as we all know, stocks go up over time. Um, they're probably, well, they are the best performing asset class over long periods of time, better than uh, gold or bonds or real estate. Um, so I wouldn't say to just be out of the market and kind of be waiting for a black swan event. But when you, when you combine a, a tail hedge with a long equity portfolio, the payout usually looks pretty attractive. Um, so the way people look at it is, you know, you're just, it's similar to buying an insurance policy. You know, you're spending a small amount of premium each year to uh, protect against a black swan event. And, and then when we do get a crash, you know, you have cash that you can redeploy and uh, buy additional equities with. So the, uh, you know, the risk return profile is, is pretty attractive. You, you know, your worst case loss each month or each year, and then you uh, have a lot of potential upside. Um, this is just kind of a simple hypothetical example I put together here. So, for example, if you had a $1 million equity portfolio um, and you're worried about a 20% crash where you're going to lose $200,000, um, you can put on a tail hedge where, let's say, hypothetically, you make 50% on, on, when the market crashes. Um, so, so in that case, you would use maybe a $400,000 trading level. And then when the market crashes, you're making 50% and you're covering your, your equity loss. You're, you're making 200 grand. Um, and and the, the good thing about it is since this is, um, these positions are long options, the margin requirements are very low. So the product can be notionally funded. Um, you don't have to come up with 400 grand. You could just maybe put up $40,000 and that would uh, give you uh, protection, you know, on, on 200,000. So um, essentially that, that tail hedge is costing you about 4% a year, um, which might sound expensive, but you know, if, if stocks are returning 10% a year, let's say consistently, and then you're sort of paying for an insurance premium so that you can sleep at night. Um, and, and another thing to mention is these far out of the money puts are usually mispriced uh, for the most part, because a lot of people ignore them. Uh, when large institutions and hedge funds look to hedge their portfolios, they're usually looking at, you know, garden variety corrections, kind of like we're in right now. You know, the s and down about 7% from the highs. I think the NASDAQ's down 10 or 11 currently. So a lot of guys just look to protect against that type of correction, like a 5 to 10% type of correction. And they sort of ignore these, you know, major crashes that come along every 10 years or so, like 1987, 2008. Um, th this year, you know, February, March of 2020. Um, so, so what happens is those far out of money puts are usually uh, pretty cheap. You know, if you look at uh, an options pricing model, they say that those events just are almost impossible to occur, or, or they're going to occur once every, you know, every million years or something. But in reality, they happen much more frequently that, than the models would forecast. So then, uh, then what's yeah. the what's the approach for you know, some of the people might be that might be here on this call, knowing that these these events are going to happen every so often, is it just commit to having some type of tail hedge um, within your portfolio and just know that this is just a sunk cost and a part of doing business and go with it, or can they go somewhere else or go directly to you? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, so if somebody. You know, if somebody has a really long time frame, like a pension fund or something, it, it might not make as much sense um, because, you know, their time or someone like Warren Buffett, you know, his time, his holding is forever. So he probably doesn't really care about market crashes and he has unlimited cash. So sure. if the market crashes, he'll buy more. I don't think but, he has unlimited years to live, though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and, and, and Buffett actually sells puts. Um, he, he sells long dated puts on the S&P. Um, it's actually part of his strategy, which, which is 
you know, if you do that on a cash secured basis where you're happy to buy the market down 10% or 20%, I, I think it's a great strategy personally. I mean, I, I do it myself mm -hmm. as well in my portfolio. Um, but, you know, if you're worried about what's going to happen in a major uh, crash, um, I think it makes sense, you know, to have to dedicate some capital to have a tail, you know, uh, tail hedging program. You can either do that through me, through, through our CTA, or if you look, want to do that yourself, you know, there's there's options you can buy. You can trade the VIX. Um, there's all there's all sorts of different trades that can be structured. But uh, that puts on the S&P are generally one of the best ways to do it, just because of the amount of uh, gamma and convexity that you get in those. So you're talking about very far out of the money deltas. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, for, for my tail program, I'm usually buying stuff that might be like a one delta or two delta or five delta put somewhere in that range. And, and, and depending on where the volatility is. So right now, ball is really high. So that, those puts are really far out of the money. They might be 50 or 60% out of the money. And the idea is not that they're going to go in the money necessarily when the market crashes, but, you know, ball is going to spike. And uh, for example, in, in March, you know, I had some puts that maybe I paid 20 or 30 cents for, and those puts went to $10. And the idea is if you're buying some really cheap puts, you can own a lot of them. So when that crash happens, you know, you, those, the value just increases uh, dramatically. So my, my, my main question to you, and this is actually what have been a personal challenge for me to my own trading. And I know probably a lot of people are thinking about it too. Um, it's, it's great to buy all these far out of the money puts and get the convexity and all this thing. But I think what, 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 what's your strategy to actually harvesting the gain? Because the problem is the market crashes, if it's quick and it goes back, it, you know, you can literally lose the half of the value of the option in a single day if the market rotates fast enough. And how do you know when to, when enough is enough and when you actually want to harvest gains and what's your whole approach to that? Yeah, that, that's actually the most difficult part. So when I was at Universal, for example, in 2008, when the market crashed, um, our, strat, our fund was actually up about 100% that year. And then the CIO thought that the market was going to keep going lower, you know, even though the S&P was at triple six, he, he thought it was going to go to like four or 500, which seemed kind of ridiculous to me. Um, but at that point, when you're up a hundred percent, you know, we would, we would leave it um, up to the client. We would ask them, you know, look, we're up a massive amount. Um, the market, this is getting overdone. The market's extremely oversold. The world is not going to end. Um, should we take profits? So, so that's how we did it there. We kind of leave it up to the client. But uh, in my CTA, you know, I've kind of made the decisions. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Like, for example, this year in March when the market crashed, um, you know, I, w I was up maybe about 10% initially uh, on these hedges. Uh, this is on the full value, the full notional value of, of the portfolio. And uh, I just saw what the Fed was doing. They came out and they basically backstopped everything. They said, we're going to do whatever it takes, uh, QE, infinity. Uh, they announced all kinds of lending programs. They're going to buy corporate bonds. So I said, you know what? I, I remember this in 2009. This happened. Um, this has to be close to the bottom. And then the market did continue to go down a little bit more from there, maybe another 5% or something. But then it ripped back and, you know, ball came in a lot. The VIX came in from 80 to 30 so I, so I just made the decision at that point. I'm like, you know, I, I have to take profits here because we're going to give it all back. And that's what would have happened. Those hedges all went to zero, you know, within a month or less within a couple of weeks. So a lot of it comes down to, I guess, the macro environment and, you know, what the return has been. Um, if I have options that have gone up, you know, 100x or something, I just feel like I have to take profits at that point. And how far out on, I'm not just strike wise, but time wise, like if you're getting a one to five delta, are you going a month out, three months out, a week out? Um, you just roll and as they, and it moves towards you, you are you going to roll? Like we're just kind of talking about rolling them. You have kind of a systematic approach to rolling them. It starts moving in your direction. Yeah. So, so most of the options are generally maybe 30 to 90 days out um, expiration wise. I don't go too far out because I like to reset the strikes. You know, if I buy an option that's 100 days out and then all of a sudden the market's 10% higher, you know, that, that option is not going to provide too much protection. So, so I like to kind of reset them every 30 days or so. Um, so right now I'm, I'm buying probably options that are, yeah, 30 to 90 days in expiration. 
Um, in terms of rolling them uh, for for the for the tail program, I don't really roll them because um, they're usually so far out of the money that it's just not worth it. There's no premium at that point. You know, if it's a if it's a ten cent option or fifty cent option, I say, what's the point of even selling that? I'll just kind of buy more um, the following month. Um, on the short option side, you know, my other strategy, I I do. If I want to sell another put, for example, I'll buy back the one that I'm short. And I'll roll it kind of on a systematic basis. But I think for a tail program, it just kind of makes sense to leave it alone and kind of wait for a black swan event to happen. Right. Doesn't yeah. it? Well, and yeah, I guess that 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 makes sense. The um, the other question. Well, it's psychologically difficult, I think, to run a tail program just because you have to consistently lose money. Yeah. Uh, I think very few people can actually pull that off correctly. Yeah, it's, it's tough to do. You have to be disciplined and just kind of always have the protection on and, and, you know, you're going to lose money nine times out of 10. Um, generally selling options is an excellent trade. Um, like we spoke about earlier, you know, you're going to make money nine times out of 10, but that one time you lose, um, you could potentially blow up or give back years of returns. So yeah, you, you just kind of have to stay dedicated and, and it, it does get boring, you know, you're just kind of losing money every month, but you gotta look at it as just sort of an insurance policy. And then you can do other stuff, you know, you can, you can be long stocks against it or do some other trades. I've got a lot of systems that lose money every month. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, the good thing is these are small yeah, losses, imagine. but it's like death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, exa exactly. Um, yeah, but combining it with other strategies that make money and having yourself hedge, it makes it makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess the other the other question was, do you have any methods for paying for it versus just buying those puts? Do you try to do other things to kind of create ranges or try to pay for that premium? Um, th there have been times where maybe I would sell another option um, that's you know not as far out of the money, and then you know, buy a multiple of, of tail, you know, protection against it. Right. So, so may, you know, maybe you're selling like a five, like a 10 Delta put, and then you're buying, you know, five times as many Delta puts or something. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I've, I've done that at, uh, sometimes, but it's a tough trade because normally what happens with the market is you get down to that, you know, short strike and it doesn't quite get to the point where you're really far out of the money stuff kicks in. And then you had to figure out, well, what do you do then? You try to hedge the gamma and then you can get whipped. You know, you're selling on the way down and buying on the way up. So, so lots of times I don't even bother with that. I just kind of own the tail protection. Um, I may, you know, I may sell calls or call spreads usually um, to, to help it offset the cost at times, but lots of times those calls are just really cheap. Um, that, that's another thing about, you know, the options market is, you know, there's, uh, a lot more demand for downside puts than, than upside calls with the exception of, you know, the whole soft bank thing and the recent, you know, uh, all these day traders and retail guys buying up calls on uh, tech names, you know, that, that putting that aside for the most part, usually there's a lot more demand for the downside puts. So, uh, and what a lot of guys do is they overwrite, you know, they sell calls against their stock positions. So those upside calls are usually cheap. Um, I, I actually, you know, I prefer to buy them. Usually when I sell them, I get into trouble because the market can just move, you know, a couple percent and all of a sudden they're at the money Almost. versus the put. Yeah. The puts a much higher ball. So you have a much bigger cushion if you're selling options. Yeah, that makes sense. What I like to do is actually sell the out the money call that you get some premium for it and buy five X of the cheap out of the money ones. But then again, it goes up a little bit and the other ones just stay out of the money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's that's generally a great trade, but yeah, you have to be careful. You know, as long as it's not too close to expiration, though, you should be okay. But once it gets close, you kind of gotta close it out. Or I, I never, I actually do those trades sixty days out or more, and more like actually one hundred twenty days out. When they get to sixty days, is when I'll roll them. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, and, and going back to your earnings trades, you know, personally, I I do a lot of sometimes I do ratio spreads on single stocks. Um, I'm not always capped, you know, sometimes I do have naked positions, but only if the vol is really, really high and I can kind of make my break even, you know, 30% out of the money or something like that, where I'll, where I'll maybe buy, you know, I'll buy one call and then sell two further out of the money calls on, on a name where the upside vol is really high and, and, it, and, it, and it's very short data, you know, it might be a week. 
So that's when you good. let me ask you a question, just as far as being a trader, when you go on vacation, isolation at some point in time, are there certain type of trades like you take off all your dick and puts and everything, and and you have anything like that when you just when you're going to like try to just unwind and leave for like a week? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, ever since I started Carbide, I haven't been able to do take like real vacations. You know, I can take like a long weekend or something, or I'm always checking the markets. But um, yeah, if I do go away, um, I'll definitely cover any short option positions. I, I, I learned my lesson there. I remember uh, I went to, I think I was in Florida for a few days, and this was when uh, Kim Jong-un started fire, firing missiles, and uh, Trump was threatening fire and fury. And, you know, I'm out at a bar or something in Florida and the market drops, you know, 5% in a day and I'm short puts that I didn't cover. And I said, oh, I'm never doing this ever again. I basically had to get on the computer from my friend's house and try to trade from my phone. Uh, it was a, it was a nightmare. So I have a, uh, yeah. I have a similar, I have a similar story on a cruise ship in the middle of the Atlantic and I had to pay a, an exorbitant amount for Wi-Fi so I can close out some positions. I understand with eight tight on exorbitant amounts, like $14. <laughs> that's on yeah. a previous that's a previous joke to the 14 dollars a megabyte maybe it was ridiculous uh the worst i ever had i had a guy that ran a cta that had about 15 20 million dollars and he called me i do programming for, for for traders and uh he told me he hadn't had a vacation in seven years he had a partner and uh promised his wife and he finally took a vacation and it was in october of 2008 and uh, when he came back, the markets had dropped and the, you know, usually the markets had always come back. Uh, and so the partner was just betting on that. And when he came back, basically he was out of business. He left, went on vacation, had 16 men under management, came back and he was effectively out of business. So it was quite, it was quite a costly vacation. Yeah, no, no, it's scary. I, I definitely learned anytime you're going to go away, just cover any short, definitely any short option positions. And then if I have long option positions, like personally, I might just put out a good till canceled order at some level that I want to take them off. And if it gets filled, great. If it doesn't, you know, no harm. So, um, yeah, just and, and just to move on here, th this is just a um, slide that I put together from a uh, Bank of America survey where they um, asked their investors, you know, what do you think is the biggest tail risk? So, so I'm just kind of, you know, putting out there what are some potential black swans that could happen. Um, of course, with black swan events, you know, the reason they're called that is you never see them coming. So in all likelihood, none of these things will be the next black swan event. Um, with the, you know, everyone thinks COVID, second wave, uh, the election, you know, it, like you guys have spoke about the election, you can see it in the ball curve, you know, the October, November vol is just really jacked on the, the big futures curve. And then from there, it just drops off. So what I think and, and Itai probably agrees is, you know, after the election, I bet that front end of the curve is going to get smoked. You know, that those, that the vols and uh, Ocknova are just going to come in a lot. I mean, the whole curve will probably come down, but the front end is going to come in the most. Uh, but one, one thing on here I thought that was interesting is inflation is, um, you know, and, te and the tech bubble. These are two things here that these weren't even mentioned in August, but now all of a sudden people are worried about them in September. Um, you know, in terms of inflation, it's hard to imagine because we're in a deflationary environment with the amount of debt and, uh, with every, you know, with, uh, jobs being taken over by tech, but, uh, you know, who knows, maybe that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. If they um, print just enough. I know. I, I always think that, that this, this time, but. I don't know, maybe they will print the right amount to cause real inflation at some point. And if they actually do trigger it, that's not what they wanted. That's going to be the worst thing ever. Yeah. I mean, Powell seems pretty intent on it, but uh, we'll see. He'll probably back. He'll probably check it out, you know, if it starts getting close. Um, and, and you know, this is one of the reasons why it's so scary if they do have to raise rates. If, if you look at this, this is the global debt to GDP. Um, it, it's just exploded, you know going up into the financial crisis of 08, you know, we, you were looking at 200% and now it's already up to 250 and it's just on an unsustainable path. So, you know, it, it, this basically tells me that the Fed can never raise rates because if they do raise rates, you know, how are we going to afford to service this debt? I mean, you're going to implode 
the entire country, the entire world. Um, but you know, you never know. They they could be their their hands could be forced. You know, maybe um, people lose faith in the the bond market and they start selling longer dated treasuries, and the Fed just doesn't have enough. You know, they they can't buy them quick enough, and then they're forced to raise rates. You know, that that could be a black swan event. Highly unlikely, but you know, it's possible at some point. Um, and then another thing, you know, valuations right now are just through the roof. Um, this is the forward P multiple on S&P 500. You can see it's actually about as high or higher than it was at the tech, the peak of the tech bubble in 1999. Um, now, you know, a couple of things could happen here. Maybe those forward earnings estimates are way too low. You know, maybe the economy comes roaring back and uh, in hindsight, this ends up being <clears throat> a, a cheap multiple. But um, yeah, it's tough to say at this point. So, so another thing, if all if all uh, company, let's say there's a vaccine tomorrow and the economy completely opens up and earnings just shoot up, then that would normalize. But if that happens, the market would probably have priced all that in and potentially have topped anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I used to say, you know, the best time to sell the market is when the, the economy reopens or, or there's a vaccine. Because by then, all the good news is probably going to be priced in. I would literally make a bet right now that there will be a top within days or weeks of announcement of vaccine. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and, and here's a couple charts to, just to show some longer term valuations. Um, so the one on the left is the 10 year PE multiple or the CAPE ratio, which, you know, just smooths things out and looks at the past 10 years earnings. Uh, the price relative to the past 10 years of earnings in the S&P 500. And you can see on a percentile basis, we're actually pretty much the most expensive the market's ever been outside of the tech bubble. Uh, we're in the 96th percentile right now, which is actually higher than uh, 2007. And uh, it looks like it's, it, so it's a little bit lower than 1929, but pretty close. And, and then on the, on the right, you can just kind of see how far, you know, that's deviated from the, the average, from the mean. Of, of where this ratio usually trades. Um, it's about two standard deviations above the mean currently. Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, I'm not saying that uh, the market's gonna crash uh, tomorrow or even next year. I mean, who knows when it's gonna happen. The, the, you know, we're still technically in a bull market and it could continue for a long time. Um, but if you step back, uh, so here's a chart that I just have up here at the NASDAQ, you know, it's pretty incredible just how overbought it is on a technical basis. This is a long-term monthly chart going back to the 90s. So you can see the 99 bubble up here. Um, and then this is the recent move higher. You know, we've had a bit of a correction here, but it's still just really far above these long-term trend lines. So, so this blue line here is uh, the average price over 50 months, a 50 month moving average. And this is a 200 month moving average. So even if the NASDAQ dropped about 30 or 40% from here, you know, it would still be in a sustained uptrend. Uh, uptrend. It would just kind of be working some uh, overbought conditions. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I guess these are some reasons why it might make sense to have some type of tail protection or hedging strategy, but I, I would never advocate getting completely out of the market because you know, in the short term, I actually think the market's a bit oversold and will probably rally in the short term. Um, but on a longer term basis, it just kind of looks very expensive and overbought. So, um, you know, in those type of environments, markets get uh, less stable and black swan events tend to happen more. So that's, uh, that's kind of the gist of it. I don't know, uh, any uh, questions or You don't trade, uh, I guess a quick question is, I mean, you're tra trading mainly like S&P, I guess, uh, ES futures options. Uh, you're not doing any kind of like VIX calls when you're doing this? Um, for, no, for the hedge, hedge program, it's really the ES uh, options or, or like I was saying, sometimes NASDAQ or Russell, but uh, NASDAQ options are quite expensive and illiquid. Um, it's, 
I, I don't know why the futures options are so liquid, you know, in the NASDAQ. It's, it's not like the triple Qs. It's a lot more difficult to trade. So I usually just stick to the S&P for the most part. And as, as a CTA, I can really only trade uh, futures. So I can't do the VIX calls because technically it's an equity product. Okay. Um, but, you know, I think owning some VIX calls is another good way to, to have some tail protection. Um, I, the, the problem with the VIX is, though, you don't always know what you're buying. I mean, because you're buying uh, calls on a certain future that, you know, you don't know how that futures curve is going to react when the market crashes. At least with the S&P options, you kind of know, you know, they have to move a certain amount when, when the S&P crashes. Um, with the VIX options, you know, maybe the market crashes, but only the front end, front end of the VIX curve really jumps and the longer dated uh, futures don't. And then your, your VIX calls aren't going to really increase in value nearly as much as you would expect. When you're doing a negative option strategy, are you doing a lot of the weeklies? When you're doing that way out of the money frame on just your naked, naked option strategy and, and how far percentage will you usually out of the money? So are you, you broke up at the beginning. You were saying on the, the short option strategy? Yeah, on the short option strategy, how far, are you doing like weekly options or like how far to expiry and how far out of the money? I mean, are you doing like 20% out of the money and you know, weekly options or what are you doing? Yeah, I, I do generally weekly options. Um, the farthest I'll probably go is maybe 30 days. But, but I would say like, uh, you know, seven to, or f five to 20 days is kind of the sweet spot. Um, and, and usually these options are, you know, currently maybe seven to 10% out of the money, somewhere in that range. I don't go quite as far as 20% out of the money because you're just not getting that much premium. And then uh, it, for, for that for that type of strategy, I think it always makes sense to sell a little bit more meaty options um, and then sell less contracts. So you're actually taking less risk. Um, it, it depends on the volatility. You know, when the VIX was back in the teens, it was more difficult to do but right now with the VIX up at 30 and um the far out of the money puts are trading at you know 50 ball somewhere in that range you you can collect some nice premium right now and uh, on, the, on the call side again like i was saying before though the calls are usually quite cheap uh the only time i'm selling calls uh naked calls is if we've had a massive run in the equity market and they're very short dated uh for the most part i like to buy the the upside calls or I may do a calendar, like I'll buy a further out of the money, uh, a further out and expiration call and then sell a shorter data call. That makes sense. I yeah. used to do uh, ra ratio spreads on the call side all the time. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be fun, uh, but it can also, uh, well, well, you were, you were usually selling one and buying two though, right? I was usually selling one and buying three. Um, okay. Yeah. So I was selling one, sometimes slightly in the money uh, and then buying three, maybe three to 5% out of the money when the VIX is low. Um, that's a good way to go about it. Usually for even money. Yeah, that, that's a great trade. I mean, especially when you get a nice move and, and balls low. I would only, I only did that when the VIX was uh, 15 or lower. <laughs> yeah. For, for when I, when I sell the naked options, I usually try to wait for some type of, uh, spike in the VIX, you know, even if it's a small one, I, um, you just, you get compensated much, much better if you get a small spike in the VIX and then you can sell really far out of the money puts at that point. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, if, if the market approaches your strike, there's things you can do, you know, you can buy, buy them back, take the loss if you have to, or roll them down and out to a further expiration, further out of money. Um, so it's kind of almost like a way of looking at a stock replacement strategy in my mind, instead of buying stocks, I'm just selling puts or, or doing a risk reversal, selling put and buying call. It's really just kind of a cheap way to, to buy the equity market. All right, cool. guys. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to say thank you so much, Aaron, for, uh, for, for being the guest speaker. You're wonderful. Thumbs up everybody. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Um, this Appreciate is the, this is the point where, uh, we we're basically going to call it a wrap for tonight. Uh, we hang out for like the next 10 minutes and we just talk about anything. It's not even market related. So anybody who wants to hang out, chat for a little bit, we'll do it. If not, everybody have a great rest of your evening.